Dr. Anna Peltsova. I, I teach at Brooklyn College and New York University, so I'm so glad to see some of my students joining me today. I'm also instructor at New York Botanical Garden and Brooklyn Botanic Garden, where I teach soils. So we'll start a little bit with urban soils, what they are, and then we will continue from there. Urban gardening, uh, it's, uh, it's on the rise and uh, around the United States and Canada there are more 18,000 community gardens. Just in New York there are more than 1,500 community gardens and thousands of gardens, home gardens in New York and of course millions of them in the United States. So gardening is obviously brings nutritious food to local communities. It reduces grocery bill, especially in this current situation is important. It uh, increases health because people exercise in fresh air. It's the community building, people in family building now because people work together. And even uh, maybe surprising, but uh, it minimizes criminal activities because people have something to do and they're less likely to do wrong things or to hurt their neighbors once they engage in the communal thing. And also it's a deeper uh, connection to agriculture and urban nature, since we are really missing nature in urban environments. But this little piece gives us a uh, peace of mind. So soils are way more than dirt. A handful of soil full of uh, microorganisms, that are, the number of them way more than people on the earth. Just a handful of soil has more people. And this is how it looks under the microscope. The tiny organism that we don't see with naked eye, but soil is a living system. It takes a really long time to process. Uh, one inch of soil can form up to 500 years. Really, really slow process, but it's so easy to uh, destroy it. The subsoil is the most productive layer and it's where we actually garden. Soil provides the nutrients that are required for plant growth. Nutrients for plants, it's like vitamins for us. If we will look under the microscope and see soil, that's what we would see. We will see some air pockets, we will see some water molecules, we will see crystals of uh, quartz and feldspar, mm, minerals that takes up 45% of uh, soil, and we will see organic matter. 5% of organic matter uh, is broken down in different types of uh, living or do dead organisms. It combined, comprised of organisms, some roots, and humus. And humus is the uh, most stable type of organic matter that is very dead, as some said, uh, but it's a nutritious part of the organic matter that's uh, beneficial for plant growth. And it's what you see if you do compost at the end of the final stage. Uh, one of the main properties of soil, and if you have a soil sample with you, uh, you can determine today what type of soil you have. A soil texture is like home address. It's number one soil test that you want to know and remember because it helps you to determine um, fertility of the soil, productivity, uh, how dry uh, your soil is or how often you need to water it, uh, how, much, how, how often you need to add nutrients, and it even gives the uh, implications for contaminants. If you look in the soil profile, if we dig soil several feet down, we're going to see differences. At the bottom here, I have a soil from New York City. It looks really pretty, right? Has all the layers, really dark, organically rich layer on top. And this is a soil, a very sandy soil from New York. Uh, this uh, sediment from the soil was brought by glaciers. If you know a little bit about geology or New York City, well, I guess it's not New York City did not exist a thousand years ago, but the region where New York City is now is a really interesting story that this uh, more than 10,000 years ago, glaciers uh, were melting and with uh, natural climate change, temperatures increased and this uh, ice was melting. It moved to the south and stopped in the middle of Long Island, in the middle of Brooklyn and Queens. For those who are in New York, if you go to Greenwood Cemetery, you will see a really vivid example of a very uh, hilly top part of Greenwood with the moraine is like teal material and a very nice flat uh, south part of Greenwood where uh, you see it's a flat area. 
So if you're driving in the South Brooklyn, you will see very flat areas. It's a glacial outwash. When water rushes to the ocean, it's deposited sediment and left uh, all the rocks in the uh, uh, northern part of uh, Long Island, Brooklyn and Queens. And uh, it's scratched everything that was on top of Manhattan, uh, exposing those rocks. That's why it's so easy to build skyscrapers in Manhattan and something we cannot do in South Brooklyn because it will collapse. It's sand. And this is also the reason why we don't have an underground subway in Coney Island. Uh, what happens with the top picture on top? It's actually very uh, well developed soil, the weathered soil in Brazil. So the picture on the bottom in New York, this soil is about 10,000 years old. Picture on top shows us 2 million years old soil. And it doesn't look uh, very distinct as uh, we would see in this um, uh, New York because it's lost already all the fertility, all the organic matter, and it's really um, not very fertile soil. And tropical soils are very poor soils, as a matter of fact. And it's how they would look, orange, very distinct color. Uh, a little bit more New York soils, uh, since uh, most of us are here. Uh, this is how diverse they look in different neighborhoods. We have Staten Island, we have the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan. And you see they diversify by different colors, by different uh, textures. Some of them more sandy, some of them more clay from a lake or wind deposits. Some of them come from the glacier uh, streams. These are uh, anthropogenic unnatural soil because they were uh, deposited by uh, humans like this construction debris or it's deposition from ash, uh, coal ash and it's a green belt series in, um, in Staten Island. This is dredged material in Brooklyn. When Hudson River uh, is uh, dredged to let the uh, ships to go through it, uh, uh, people need to grab this material and transport it somewhere else. So they transport it to Floyd Benefield. And then it creates these layers, the distinct layers that you can see on this interesting photo. And then uh, more soil here uh, over till unsorted material in, uh, in Manhattan. So you see this diversity. If you get out at least one thing from this presentation is that soils are heterogeneous in urban environments. They're very different from agricultural soil or rural soils because of this heterogeneity. Uh, diverse uh, management practices, diverse depositions, natural depositions, and also human depositions. Most uh, of soils are transported, they're not local. And in our case, the, uh, originally, they were transported by the glaciers. If you take a look, close look inside of the soil profile, we will see lots of lots of interactions. There will be always some living organisms interacting with minerals, breaking down those minerals. Uh, organisms will interact with roots, creating symbiotic relationships like microbes or fungi uh, that they help um, plant to succeed in its growth. And in return, um, they will give sugars for fungi and microbes. Texture, structure and consistency, color and smell, compaction, bulk density, um, water movement, and it can be percolation and infiltration and um, permeability of the soil, porosity that all connects to that. pH and salinity content, nutrient content, catching exchange capacity, which is a major of uh, fertility of the soil, organic matter content and of course heavy metals and many others. Yeah, so let's, uh, for those who have it, let's, uh, let's get some, uh, some soil and see what you can get uh, with the simple task to make, uh, to fill the soil and to create a sausage and see what kind of uh, texture you get. For this, you need to uh, try to fill it, put it in your hand, uh, between your fingers, how does it feel? Is it feel rough? Rough, it's like uh, brown sugar between your fingers. It's indicative of a sand. So if you feel sandy, like grittiness, like sugar, that means it's very rough. Flour, um, like kitchen flour, you know, it uh, feels smooth. So that's probably indicative of a silt. And if it's sticky between your fingers, then it would be clay. Uh, try to make a sausage between your fingers, your hands. 
Uh, and you can see on the slide how sausage may look. If you have a really rough soil, it's all pure sand, you're not able to make any sausage. It will just like collapse. If uh, you can make a sausage, try to bend it and see if you can make like a half moon or if you can actually make a ring. I don't know if anyone get that much clay to make a ring, but try. What do you get? Once we identify soil texture, we really need to dig a little bit down uh, uh, from uh, organic matter. So when you guys uh, have a chance to do it, uh, uh, identify your soil texture by digging a little bit down under your composted layer. And then when you don't have this organic method, it's actually when you can make this and, and see what you're getting. And this is a very simple test, just you know, by field method, you can see if it's a sandy, silt, or clay. Uh, in this case, you want to have something intermediate, like silty, uh, loamy soil. That's the best thing for gardening. Uh, sand or clay are a little bit of extremes and it's hard to manage those soils. And consistency, we identify by taking a clump of soil and just squeezing it between your fingers. Um, if uh, it's loose, it's non coherent, it just collapses on your fingers very easily. If it's friable, then um, um, it's, you can crush it with very easy, you know, very easily. Uh, if it's firm, you need to apply a little bit of force. And if it's very firm, then you need to have like a hammer or something to break it. Very, very hard. This is a simple test, but it actually shows us how hard for the roots to go through this uh, type of soil and how hard it is to dig through the soil. So it's very firm or firm. It's indicative that roots may have a hard time to penetrate this to, this to soil. If it's loose, that maybe it's um, uh, susceptible to erosion. Okay, so friable is the best type of soil for root penetration and also holding some aggregation. Another property that is super important, uh, especially like in springtime when we start growing, is the color, uh, soil temperature that correlates to the color. So dark colored soil, uh, brown, dark brown, uh, black, they are absorbing sunlight energy very readily. And it's what we typically observe from like a northeast coast. But if it's a light colored soil, it reflects back and uh, soils remain cooler. When your temperatures really affect uh, root development, as you can see on this um, simple graph, that there are optimal temperatures that we need. And this isn't degrees Celsius, but like 20 degrees Celsius would be like um, 65, 70 Fahrenheit or something like that. So that's the best uh, uh, temperature for root development. If it's too cold or too hot, it restricts this root growth. So that's important to remember. So in summer, when it's too hot, plants don't really grow well, right? Uh, soil temperatures are also uh, effective of uh, seed germination. We need to reach certain temperatures when um, before planting uh, or seeding uh, our plants. Nutrient availability. Uh, plants um, can uptake nutrients that are dissolved when temperatures are appropriate, when they're warm, because if it's too cold, nutrients cannot dissolve on the soil. Or if it's too hot, there's now no moisture for them uh, to react. Uh, with, uh, with chemicals. So they, again, nutrients are not available. So temperatures and moisture really uh, important for nutrient availability. And the microbes uh, also like warm temperature. They're not active when it's too cold or too hot. Color is really important uh, property of soil because it can tell us about the organic matter composition or content. Um, and the darker the color, if it's black, it signifies there's a high organic matter content. So it's lots of food, lots of nutrients for our plants and microbes. Uh, it's also indicative of drainage and aeration. And typically, uh, the, this color is given either by organic matter or some oxides, like uh, iron oxide or um, manganese oxide or calcium. They can give distinct colors to the soil. So by looking at that, we may predict what is the composition of the soil and even predict pH of the soil. So because like when the soil is white, whitish, it uh, significant, uh, signifies that uh, soil has calcium or sodium. And if those cations, those ions are present, it's typically very high pH, more than eight. 
Sodium with pH more than 10. You probably know that pH of the soil neutral is seven, right? So having too much sodium, it will be very bad for plant growth. Not many plants can survive that. Having orange soil like this soil is actually uh, give us the opposite. The orange signifies rust and iron uh, or aluminum, and it uh, tells us the pH is low and maybe pH lower than five. And when it's black soil, it's uh, typically organic matter, it's uh, kind of stabilizes the soil composition and it's more or less uh, neutral or uh, slightly acidic. So the color can signify this what we have. So the question for you, what are some colors encouraged by well aerated conditions? Add, it's brown and yellow because it's iron oxidation, the, like, uh, this soil would have very good drainage and it shows that iron is oxidized. Iron is oxidized, it means there is air, there is oxygen and water can uh, drain really well. Good. So what are some colors that can uh, encourage poorly aerating conditions? So that's actually like greenish, bluish, uh, grayish color. So green, gray, blue. There's a term for that, it's called glay, G-L-E-Y. Uh, that's uh, actually come from Russian language. Uh, there are lots of terms that came from Russian because the uh, father of soil science or grandfather of soil science is Dakuchayev uh, from Russia. Uh, and soil science is actually quite young. I probably should tell you that it's like 150 years old. It's people, as much as we garden and farm for thousands of years, no one actually studied soils as a uh, as a discipline, as its own course in the university. Unless, well, until this late 1900s, uh, when Dakuchayev decided to classify Russian soils, and then his classification spread around the world. And it, in America, the first classification was developed like in 1940s. And then um, uh, after that, it became like a really huge, huge uh, science, uh, big, uh, important part of the Department of Agriculture. And you probably know that it was developed, uh, uh, NRCS, um, Natural Resource Conservation Service, was created after Dust Bowl in the 1930s when people got the problem with erosion and understood how it's important to study soil. So that's quite a new subject. Um, it's actually fun stuff. You can uh, you can take any jar. I have this, you know, plastic tube, but you can take any transparent jar with a flat uh, bottle, a bottom, um, add the soil, just avoid organic matter like mulch or leaves or roots and, and gravel. Try to get just the uh, sm small particles, add it to a jar, uh, fill with water all the way to the top, shake it really nicely and leave it for a day and two. And after you're going to see this uh, really distinct gradation, and that's a way how we determine soil texture. Then you can uh, see what is the percentage of each uh, layer, sand, silt, and clay. That is all. This is the order it will fall. It will fall. It always follow this order because sand is larger, it's denser, so it falls first, followed by silt, medium texture soil, um, sediment, and clay. And uh, sand and silt are very similar in its mineralogy. It's mostly made of quartz and feldspar. You see sand a lot on, on the beach, uh, but um, clay is different. So important to remember that clay has two definitions. Clay is a size, which you see here now, and clay minerals. So there are minerals that are clay, like oxides, like carbonates, uh, silicates, another type is clay. And those clay minerals are very important because they will determine the quality of soil, its fertility, pH, workability, how easy to work with the soil or not, and how well they can hold water and nutrients. So it, uh, it's another, at Brooklyn College, we have an entire course on, on clay mineralogy. Uh, and clay uh, minerals are secondary minerals meaning they formed from other minerals. For example, when granite that you all know, it's a building material everywhere. When it breaks down uh, into feldspar, into quartz, into mica, some of the pieces of garden, the pyroxene, 
Feldspar and mica, minerals that you commonly find everywhere in all soil, it uh, will con dissolve in the soil solution. It will uh, become ions, so like it dissolves, and then it will precipitate again, forming clay minerals. And clay minerals will be different in different regions in different parts of the world. Uh, now let's look at the uh, water movement and soil structure. So soil um, aggregates will form different soil structure. To really identify soil structure, you need to dig a little bit down into in the soil and get like a clump and see uh, the shape of the aggregates, uh, the clumps of soil. It's really important to have those aggregates in the soil. You don't want to have loose soil that just like fall from your uh, hands. It's not good. Uh, your soil should be stable and should have aggregates. If the aggregates are small, like up to one centimeter, it's considered to be granular soil. If soils are uh, having more than one centimeter, uh, it's blocky soil. And this is like, so aggregates look like blocks. Uh, clay soils may form this uh, distinct plates because clay structure itself, we would if we looked under electron microscope, we would see this uh, clay forming uh, plates. So on the larger scale, well, all these uh, plates together, they form plated structure. And this is the worst structure for penetration of water in the soil because it will take so much time for water to go through around all these avenues. And roots of our plants will die, will rot from standing so much or so long in this water because they need air in order to absorb water and you know for their lovely livelihood just because water is there standing it doesn't mean plants can take it they still need oxygen to take water in and the best water uh, penetration would be in granular because it's porous it has aggregates but uh, it's also uh, allows for really nice uh, movement of water and the platy is extreme here. A, a pH, from scientific point of view, it's a amount of hydrogen ions, H plus, right? Like in water, so hydrogen. Um, this hydrogen, when it builds up from rain, uh, it creates a city condition in the soil. When there is no rain, there's less hydrogen, then uh, other cations will accumulate. Like, um, like magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium. or So when we have this type of soil, we should be uh, aware what kind of plants we can grow. It will be very hard to grow blueberries in pH higher than, uh, you know, seven or eight because blueberries like acidic pH. So by testing our soil, uh, you can uh, determine what plants will grow in your soil. And throughout my courses, I always teach, test, diagnose, and treat your soil. You always should start with testing and to know what you have to make a smart decision of what you can plant. Some soil properties like pH is easy to change. You can add sulfur to decrease pH. You can add lime powder made of limestone or marble to increase pH. Those are um, uh, coming from rocks, so they are mineral uh, minerals and not really harmful to the environment unless you pour it too much. Uh, they're not really toxic. Um, or you can do like pine needles, you can crush them to make it more acidic soil. So this property that's easy to change. Soil texture is something tricky to change. You really should not try to change your soil texture unless you're working on like on a small plot or container when you can uh, mix uh, easily different proportions. But if you're a farmer, don't try to change soil texture. Don't try to figure out how much clay or sand to add. It's, uh, it's practically impossible. The best thing to do is to add organic matter. Because organic matter, be it uh, compost or manure or biochar or any other organic uh, waste, uh, it will help to mitigate these um, properties and uh, make like clay soils more porous or sandy soils more water holding um, um, than um, 
than trying to change the like sand and clay and figure out the proportions between them. That's it's very difficult to do. So soil pH is easy to test. You can just buy kits um, in, I don't know, anywhere in the hardware store probably, uh, or you can even do uh, soil approximates like soil pH at home. If you add uh, vinegar to your soil, it, uh, in the, it fizzes, then you have pH more than seven, like eight at least, or the more it fizzes, the higher pH is. And if you add the, your um, baking soda to uh, soil mixed with water to make like kind of look muddy, uh, and it fizzes, then you have pH that is acidic, like five, six. If it does not react to any of these two tests, it's close to neutral. Plenium, um, uh, sodium, and silicon um, are like beneficiary uh, elements. It's uh, only certain plants require them, but most plants don't require them. Uh, but nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus considered as macronutrients or major nutrients. They are found in large quantities in soil and it's easy to test for them by yourself. So here, um, the kit you can buy and there are some other kits. I use La Mate, you can buy rapid test or anything you find. Uh, they're not expensive, like $20, $30, and you can do multiple tests for them. And this is what I, uh, I, I tasted yesterday with the soil I had, and I found it was like um, medium to high um, nitrogen, had a medium phosphorus and very high potassium. Uh, this is very high and you can compare it to this color chart that comes with it so it's very easy test to do and kind of fun uh, some other nutrients that are found in soil necessary for plant growth are calcium magnesium and sulfur they are considered secondary nutrients secondary macronutrients because they also uh, need plants in large quantities um, and then there is the boron, zinc, copper, manganese, iron, chlorine, molybdenum. Sometimes it's also nickel. Um, the, those are micronutrients. They are required by plants in a very tiny amount. And uh, they, are, they can become really toxic uh, if we add too much of micronutrients. So this, this like tolerance level is very small for micronutrients. It's very easy to fall into deficiency or toxicity. That's why we need to test this in the lab. So some things that we can add to improve nutrient content in soil, of course it's a fertilizers, you know, organic or synthetic fertilizers, but also some amendments that we can use from our household uh, or like yard work. Um, it's some agricultural waste. So rice residuals, wheat residuals, oil biomass, sawdust, coconut shells, seaweed, nut shells, cotton seeds, um, waste leaves, um, you know, like olive oil instructions, apple cores, banana peels, orange peels, soybeans, and so on, coffee greens, probably know about that. So those things are enriching nutrients and uh, we can, instead of throwing them out, we can chop them, let them uh, to decompose in the compost if possible, or sometimes if it's, uh, you know, small parts, you can even uh, spread around your garden and it will um, decompose. Just uh, don't leave it in your container inside of the house because that will rot. Uh, it's not, um, or like, don't use garden soil in, in the container in, your, in the house. You need to have um, uh, its own potted material that is very loose and it's already well uh, decomposed. But soil organisms, they produce or they um, play different roles in the soil. Uh, some of them help to produce nutrients, to release nutrients. Some of them shred detritus. Uh, some of them feed on other organisms to keep their population. So uh, uh, they're considered as ecosystem engineers because they engineer soil. So uh, here we can see the different, some it's very generalized, of course, it's like soil organisms can take its own course. They're very interesting and very complex. So microflora, very tiny uh, organisms, uh, they can, they break down and oxidize organic matter. Examples would be like fungi um, and um, bacteria. Uh, you probably know that bacteria, then uh, like on legume plants, they uh, inoculate roots and help to um, convert nitrogen from the air 
into nitrate or ammonia that uh, can be uh, used by uh, plants because plants cannot take nitrogen from the air directly. They need it in a converted form. And that's what this bacteria do it. Fungi can help to uh, break down rocks and mine for phosphorus, copper, or zinc. And phosphorus cannot be uptaken from atmosphere because there is nothing in the atmosphere. There are no way to synthesize it chemically as uh, nitrogen, you know, like nitrogen fertilizers. And phosphorus sources only rocks or like in compost, you know, it's from organic matter. So fertilizers, phosphorus fertilizers are coming from rocks and those rocks, um, spoiler alert, are running out. We are in the middle of like a phosphorus paradox when uh, one day if you're not find different ways how we can uh, recycle phosphorus that's already in the environment, we may not have phosphorus to add to the soil. So scientists around the world right now are finding a way how we can find uh, phosphorus from other uh, renewable sources. But fungi are doing a great job uh, getting this phosphorus from rocks, uh, minerals, from far distances and bring it to the plant. And in return, uh, they will give uh, sugar for, for fungi. Uh, microfauna, bacteria, some protozoa, uh, they can, uh, the, especially like protozoa, they feed on bacteria, keeping its population at the right, right size. Good things are good, but you know, everything needs to be in harmony in its proper size. There are some larger organisms that shred detritus, like leaves, uh, branches, help to bring the size down, and then uh, it will be easier to dissolve in, in the water, releasing nutrients. And the macrofauna, uh, macrofauna they uh, also shred detritus. They bioturbate soil, like mixing organic matter nutrients in the soil. Uh, examples would be, of course, like worms and nematodes. Uh, they bury organic matter, they bring it downwards and they make it available for roots in a different depths. And of course, they're really good uh, for um, aggregation. They uh, uh, create structure in soil. And that's what we saw before. It's really important for water movement, for infiltration and decreasing runoff and erosion because we want water to go in, not over to neighbors. Okay, some uh, management uh, ideas uh, to increase soil organisms, we want to uh, decrease tillage. Uh, so if you try no till technology or at least like uh, strip tillage or like rich tillage, like when you take parts of your garden that is still a no till, uh, it's easy for uh, microbes to uh, reestablish its population afterwards because they will just go from no till area to tilled area and it's way better than to have the entire area tilled. Uh, compaction is a big issue, especially if we walk uh, on the wet uh, area after a heavy rain. So we want to keep compaction to the minimum because it reduces the air, reduces pore space. Plants have hard time to go through compacted soil. And uh, if uh, organisms cannot survive in this environment, it will decrease um, nutrient content for, for the plants. Uh, pesticides or fungicides unintentionally can kill organisms, organisms that are not intended to be killed. So something to keep in mind when you use them. And we can feed uh, organisms uh, by adding fertilizers, uh, by adding amendments, conditioners, compost, uh, different um, um, agro waste that we just um, saw examples of. It will provide carbon, it will provide nitrogen that bacteria feed on. Uh, essential nutrients for plants and it will promote biological diversity. By having a big diversity, really great diversity in soil, it will help to uh, boost the immune system of the soil. So soil will become more uh, resistant uh, and resilient. To show you the sample distributions, about 2,000 samples that we collected from you guys sending us soils. And uh, we were able to map and see most of the samples are coming from the northern part of Brooklyn. You can guess because it's the most industrial area, at least in the past, and had lots of issues. Um, and that's where most of the concerns are. People send their soils to us because they uh, probably know that uh, they are at risk. 
So some uh, contaminants that are found in soils uh, here in New York, uh, it's lead, arsenic, and cadmium is a bigger problem than arsenic, uh, copper, zinc, um, chromium, and nickel. So lead and cadmium um, actually big issues and cadmium quite often underestimated. They all have different ecological risks. So in New York, we found that uh, lead and cadmium, they have the most risk to plant community and human health. We find again, it's Northern Brooklyn, Greenpoint and Williamsburg that have the highest concentration of lead. And it's uh, going down, it's, it's decreasing as we go close to suburbs. And it's a um, typical uh, pattern for all the cities in America uh, when the uh, inner cities would have uh, historical contamination, historical you know, industry uh, where this uh, deposits of lead in this case would come from and also high traffic areas and lead in paint. Um, and it would uh, go down as we go, as we get close to suburbs when there was less industry, less um, traffic. Uh, lead was known for over 5,000 years. People keep adding it to everywhere. We added it to, um, you know, to gasoline, to paint, we distribute it in the atmosphere. It's now it's end up in the soil. Uh, but people knew about this effect uh, a long time ago. It's not new finding. Ancient Romans added lead to the wine to make it sweeter. Can you imagine? And uh, nowadays, uh, more and more new research shows that uh, ancient, um, just like the kings and Romans, were actually affected by lead and uh, they had the health uh, and cognitive development issues because of this high concentration of lead. Arsenic came to, uh, to be known at the later stages. It's, um, like 900 um, uh, to Europe, it came at the 19th, 17th century. To America, it came at the late of 1900s. Uh, to Massachusetts, and uh, lead arsenate specifically was used to kill gypsy moth. That was impossible to kill with anything else, but uh, only with this lead arsenate. So they would spread it, as you can see on this photo, directly to orchard trees, to peach trees, apple trees or to um, potato fields. Why is it so important to study? So lead is neurotoxin. It affects cognitive development of children. Arsenic is a human carcinogen, so it, it can cause cancer and it slowly can leach in the groundwater. Uh, some main sources of lead, again, it's a paint lead, it's a point source emitters, some from the industry, from coal yards, mm, smelters, um, factories, manufacture. And lead gasoline emissions, uh, they banned, was banned in 1978, but legacy is still there. Sources of arsenic as pesticides, as already mentioned, and uh, pressure treated lumber. So avoid pressure treated lumber or some wood preserves that would have arsenic, chromium, and uh, copper. Those also not good to use because it will all stay in the soil. Uh, if you want to learn what to do with this, uh, I have uh, I published my opinion piece back in September. You can just Google and find this uh, Gotham Gazette article. So scientists advice, test for lead. It's for general public, not scientific. Um, so you can get an idea what to do with it, but I will walk you through um, some steps. So step one is to test your soil. It, it costs in our labs, and I'm affiliated with labs at the Brooklyn College, you probably heard of us, or New York City Urban Soil Institute. Uh, it's like $10 test for one sample, but you get um, to know how much contaminants you have in the soil. We, we use this uh, really cool X-ray fluorescent analyzer that you see on this photo. And uh, it's really, you can test for other things, but really for heavy metals, you must send it to the lab and uh, see what you have. If you find the soils are contaminated, don't freak out because there are solutions how you can handle this contamination. And I'll tell you what you need to do. So, we can remediate the soil, we can plant still in contaminated soil, uh, or we can bring new soil. So let's take a look. 
Land use and management practices. It's a very generalized diagram I made some time ago, but we can see that uh, if our soil is only in parks, only in forest recreation areas, and we are not um, planning on uh, growing vegetables there, we can just plant vegetated cover. If you're a landscape designer, that's a great solution to just cover it vegetation. So the lawn or uh, like really nice um, grasses will um, will keep this contamination under and it's safe for kids to play on this ground. If we have um, gardens, there are several things to do. Actually, many things to do. I'll focus on several of them. Um, I'll get to them in a minute and ornamental gardens. If it's ornamental gardens, you can grow cover crops, you can do fighter technology. There's some even uh, ornamental plants that are now found to work for fight uh, remediation well, but uh, fight remediation is a little bit tricky. You, it's not as easy as you might think, and it takes several years to remediate soil, and um, uh, it doesn't work for lead. Okay, so don't buy when they tell you uh, you can get plant some plant and it's going to take lead. It will contaminate the plant enough to be unhealthy for us to consume but not enough to extract soil to make it clean. Because lead, as you already know, it's immobile. It doesn't move in the soil, so it does not go into a plant. It does not translocate at the rates we need to remediate the soil. And um, for other uh, contaminants, it may work, but for lead, it, it's, it doesn't really. So for food producing gardens, it's what we are working on um, today is you can build raised beds, uh, you can do, uh, I'll tell you how, you can do amendments, we already introduced to some of those amendments. Uh, amendments, uh, organic amendments, uh, like biochar, manures, biosolids, uh, they can um, create organic mineral complexes uh, with the uh, soil, with contaminants in soil, and hold them for some period of time. No one knows for how long yet because it's quite new uh, research, but it will stabilize it for, for some years. Um, you can also try to do it with phosphates, but my research has shown it's not as effective as composts or like organic amendments. It's, uh, it's tricky how much you need to add and at which conditions to make this phosphorus bind with lead. It is possible and the many re successful research show it, it, work, it, it um, forms pyromorphic mineral, lead phosphate mineral that stabilizes lead, making it not available for humans or for plants. But again, it's not uh, as easy to use um, as organic uh, compost. Biochar. Uh, you may heard, you may not heard of it, but it's really cool amendment. Uh, if you see it, feel free to buy it. It um, has all these beautiful benefits as any compost do, but uh, it's basically uh, com combusted uh, plants. Um, very often it's woody, like mulch combusted um, uh, wood or branches or even grasses. So it's combusted under uh, high temperatures, but no oxygen condition. So it sequesters carbon. It preserves carbon instead of releasing it to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, because it's combusted under no oxygen condition. So it preserves the carbon, and that's why you want to have biochar in the soil, because we sequester carbon mitigating the climate change. That's important. Uh, Biosolids, you know, it's a human waste that is uh, also uh, some scientists say it's good, some scientists say it's bad because we cannot test for other mm, disease, maybe bacteria, viruses that are coming from human body and science cannot test for. So there are pros and cons with biosolids, so keep in mind. Okay, so if you want to plant in your contaminated garden, you still can plant uh, in your soil uh, by knowing uh, concentrations of metals. That's why it's important to test. And here from Cornell, my, Professor McBride, uh, he developed like uh, some guidelines, what we need uh, to have in the soil, uh, thresholds of concentration of lead and arsenic to safely grow different produce. So here you can see some concentrations. Uh, you can uh, safely grow uh, 
fruit vegetables uh, that are tall, um, they're far from the soil surface, uh, uh, in a moderately contaminated soil. Because the fruits uh, will be far from the surface, don't get splashed on the surface. And also fruit vegetables typically have very strong physiological barriers that don't allow for contaminants to translocate into fruits. Uh, which is the opposite for, for, uh, for root vegetables. Root vegetables, they can actually get a quite high concentration of metals, either through uptake like carrots, you know, the core in the carrot. It's actually a second mechanism. Lead can easily get inside. It doesn't help to peel carrot uh, because uh, it's not where mostly lead locates. It's inside of the core. Or, like in, in my research in the Duke Farm in New Jersey, we found that it's adhered to particles that the, the dominant source of lead and arsenic and vegetables. Because we can't completely wash off contaminants. No, no, no matter how well we try to wash it, we cannot completely wash it off. You decrease it, but does not completely wash away because there's a very strong tension between particles, so this contaminants, and the surface of, of a vegetable. And uh, this problem of contamination is not just urban environment problem, but it's also suburban. Because this contaminants, again, it's not just due to industrial or traffic, high traffic areas or, the, you know, gasoline, uh, but it's because of the pesticides it's applied. And in the Northeast, it's a common problem in New York State, in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and, um, in New Jersey. So it's not just urban environment problem. Um, so lettuce or like um, spinach, they can get contamination from splashes. So they trap these contaminants on their surfaces from, sur from surrounding areas because they're very short plants. If you grow herbs, they're even the worst. They have very large surface area because they have small leaves, right? So when you count all those leaves together, it's a really large surface area. And they have a high, um, you can see me better now. And uh, they have um, also uh, hair uh, on their leaves. So that uh, traps the contaminant. So for herbs, it's really important to know the, the soil uh, and heavy metal contamination in the soil. But again, by knowing how much you have in the soil, you can choose what uh, vegetables to grow. You can grow eggplants or like cucumbers, you know, or like that will grow further, especially like if you make um, like a fence for them, or like tomatoes, squash, it is far from the soil and they will be, uh, they will be safe. Don't grow carrots or radishes in contaminated soil, but grow fruit vegetables. And today I prepared a little demonstration on how to remediate contaminated soils. Here's an example of a typical urban soil um, in, from New York City. Um, it's a little bit compacted and it has a very high concentration of lead. So what a typical gardener can do is to use these three simple ways, adding mulch, growing grasses, and adding compost. Uh, this is the first uh, solution for remediation, is adding mulch uh, to contaminated uh, soil uh, that will be buried the soil underneath, decreasing your uh, splash and having dust control. Of course, this mulch will break down over time and the organic matter needs to be added probably every single year. So this is a very short term solution. A little bit longer term solution is by growing grasses that will regrow every year. And uh, uh, just like mulch, um, these grasses will uh, have a dust control so the soils will not blow in the way um, and it decreases splash of the rain. So the soil here is well buried under this uh, grass cover. Uh, fibrous roots of grasses will uh, have also beneficial effects on the soil and soil biota uh, by bringing this extra organic matter. And finally, a little bit more um, advanced method of uh, remediating contaminated soils is by adding compost. Compost is enriched in organic matter and it will have two uh, main effects on the soil. One, um, organic matter will overall dilute um, concentration or total concentrations of heavy metals uh, in the soil 
because we bring extra material in it. And two, uh, there will be chemical reaction that uh, uh, or where organic matter binds with the metals, making it less harmful to uh, human health. Um, and by adding organic matter, to do your soil, you make it also more uh, beneficial for microorganisms and you bring nutrients to the soil. Um, so the, here's ingredients from Cornell um, guideline of the kitchen, looking at, at eggshells, fruit peels, seeds, nutshells, coffee grounds, some vegetable fruit scraps. In the yard, you can take um, some hay and straw, wood chips, grass clips, leaves, manure, ashes. Uh, it's always advisable to avoid uh, some uh, animal products because they will rot and attract rodents. Uh, you could potentially do compost the uh, meat, but you need to be careful with that and actually make a hole in the soil that is deep enough so uh, like dogs or any animals uh, will not um, dig it out. So, but you know, better to avoid it in the urban environments. Uh, there are so many great resources how you can uh, compost yourself or you can get the free compost through New York City, compost projects through Earth Matter for like BQ Ride. Um, so there are quite few amazing organizations around New York that I know of and I'm sure in your uh, states and your cities there are others as well. So compost is an amazing benefit as we already discussed. But design of gardens is also matters. So uh, we already said no treated wood, right? Because it may have arsenic, copper, and chromium, and uh, we want to cover it um, or mulch it. So this is actually an example in Switzerland. I, I took this photo in, in Lugano. This is how they do it. Uh, but quite similar, I've seen some similar in New York as well. Uh, if you know, especially if you are like in a potentially contaminated area, uh, it's advisable to have like landscape fabric on top or cover with mulch to uh, decrease this exposure to contaminants. Uh, landscape fabric um, on top of the contaminated soil and then you build the raised bed. Uh, it's really a cool urban gardening uh, illustrated guide in the WNYC Poison Gardens article. Uh, it's really straightforward. You need this bunch of different tools and supplies. You can uh, look up the website. I put the link here. Uh, you um, probably have it all at home anyway. Uh, step one, you need to clear the debris from the yard and establish your um, uh, landscape fabric. The landscape fabric you buy in the store, it should be porous enough for water and air to go through the soil. Uh, don't use uh, cardboard or newspapers because they will degrade very quickly. You would rather use fa uh, landscape fabric that uh, will uh, stay for several years. It's not more permanent, it's temporal, it will be only serving you for, you know, like for several years, uh, but uh, it's better than just gardening in a contaminated soil. After that, uh, you would uh, build your boxes uh, and you, you choose the height of your boxes according to your needs. Uh, uh, tall plants typically have uh, deeper roots, so like for tomatoes, you would want to have a box that is deeper or lettuce that don't require much. So depending on what you want to grow, you want to have corresponding height of your box. Uh, fill container with a clean soil. So you need to know where you take your clean soil from. And keep in mind that uh, it should not be just a compost because compost is just organic matter. And uh, you will see um, if you just plant the compost, it will not retain water. It will just like drain through it because there are no minerals, no clays to help to hold this water. It can also create imbalance of nutrients because compost is enriched in nutrients. And when these nutrients are abundant, they will uh, leach uh, each other. So like, uh, some um, the calcium is stronger than uh, sodium, so it will leach sodium. So you need to have uh, sediment, you need to have sand, silt, and clay, and organic matter, not just pure compost. After you build your containers or your boxes, uh, make sure to cover surrounding area with, uh, uh, with some mulch, wood chips, again to avoid splash of this contamination, uh, contaminated soil into your newly established beds. Because after the rain, contaminated soil can still get 
over this uh, very, if you have low uh, boxes, it can get to your soil. Um, and then you plant and you go, you grow your amazing garden. And in this soil that's clean, you can grow anything you want. Um, but where do you get clean soil, right? So if you're in New York, you can get this clean soil bank. Uh, soil, it's uh, it's actually not soil. It's a sediment. It's a glacier sediment. At the beginning of this uh, presentation, I told you that uh, New York City soils are made of sediment that were brought by glaciers, right? If you're a community-based organization, you can get the uh, like a truck or two. How many? How much you need of this clean, pristine, sandy sediment, uh, and bring it to your garden. It's a sediment. It's not soil. Soil and sediment, the difference is in organic matter. You do need to add compost to your soil, if uh, to the sediment to make a really nice nutritious compo uh, soil. We did this experiment a few years ago. We took the sediment, this glacier sediment, we amended with compost. And we did like, the best result was like 50% of sediment, 50% of compost. And we had really great yield in vegetables, like common vegetables and the vegetables were safe for consumption, they were clean. So don't just plant and compost, uh, use the topsoil from a verified vendor. Uh, why verified vendor? Because compost, if you buy them, um, you don't know what they're made of and they can be contaminated. Also, we at college, we tested some compost and some of them were found to have uh, elevated levels of lead. And when we called vendors, they were not able to tell us uh, where it came from. Of course, if you do it yourself, you know what you put, so it's safer. Uh, match plants according to the soil quality. Don't try to grow something that is not appropriate for your soil pH or soil texture. Um, or, you know, so like it's not going to grow in this very firm soil that you have. So test, diagnose and treat your soil. Um, you may change some of the properties of the soil if it's like pH or nutrient content, but again, if it's soil texture, it's hard to change. If you want to improve water retention, add organic matter to your soil if it's too clay or too sandy. If you have loam, which is the approximately the same or equal proportion of sand, silt, and clay, uh, then uh, you have the best uh, garden soil. So that's why it's important to test again. Maintain organic matter, maintain biodiversity in your soil. Don't overuse organic matter. Don't add more than 20%. Uh, add some sustainable amendments like biochar, compost, manure. Uh, try to avoid peat moss because it's actually a fossil. I'm uh, working on my own soil, um, soil book, so lab mail that you can test on your own. So hopefully it will uh, come to life soon. Uh, I do hope you will be interested in more webinar classes, so please uh, identify your, you know, uh, your interest. Um, if you like uh, this webinar, so you want to have more, please consider uh, supporting these future webinars through PayPal or Venmo. If you don't follow me on Instagram, you can still sign up at Soul Expert, it's open account. Email me if you have questions, if you're interested in additional webinars or courses. And I will try to post more on my YouTube so you can get some more um, information.